Golf Central on YouTube is brought to you by the new Apex Irons from Callaway. To earn a spot in the LPGA Hall of Fame was 30 wins. You personally had 29 and chased that 30th win for a while. What did you think at the time about a system that said 29 wins wasn't good enough for the Hall of Fame, but 30 was? Well, it's something that dogged me for well over a year and a half with. Um, the old criteria had 40 wins with no majors, 35 wins with one major, and 30 wins with two majors. And, you know, I joined the tour when I was 18 years old. I, I You don't know, turn pro or, or, or play the game to, to be in a Hall of Fame, but I gathered a lot of wins in those years and was stuck on number 29. And uh, the other majors that I had won didn't count for anything. I had five majors, so they didn't count for anything. Uh, they, they really determined the hierarchy in golf, that they were going to, in women's golf, were going to have a, a dead Hall of Fame if they didn't do something about it back in 1998, I think it was. And so that's when they developed this point system of 27 points. Um, and so it was something that every sports writer in every city would say to me, you know, you're going to win this week. It made the game less fun for me. Um, winning one more tournament was not going to prove anything to me in my career that I didn't know. And, um, you know, I really do in my conversation with Lydia about a month ago, I really do know what she was going through. So you mentioned that rule change to 27 points. That was around 1998. As you mentioned, 1999, you are formally inducted into the LPGA Hall of Fame. That 27-point criteria has sometimes been criticized as being too high of a bar, and others say it's a Hall of Fame. It's supposed to be hard to get into. What do you think? I think that it, the bar needs to be very high. Um, the Hall of Fame rewards greatness and it rewards character and it, it, it uh, honors longevity for a period of time that you've been devoted to the game and all the hours that nobody sees that you put in. Um, you know, um, it's, it's a really tough Hall of Fame. It was before, back before I passed the mark. Um, and it should remain high as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, winning's a byproduct of playing great golf. Um, you don't, you know, it's getting yourself into contention. You lose more than you win. And um, so, you know, I'm a, in favor of it remaining tough. And all of that being said, you have a Hall of Fame to play devil's advocate without Laura Davies, without Meg Mallon, without Hollis Stacy, among others. So, Keeping it tough, what else do you think can be done to adjust for players like those? Well, um, you know, the World Golf Hall of Fame has, uh, you know, Hollis is in it, Meg Mallon and uh, Laura Davies are in, the, are in the World Golf Hall of Fame. Um, and so, um, you know, the LPGA has its own mark, uh, but um, I don't know that anything really needs to be done that much. I think that um, it should reward greatness and it should re reward quality of play. You know, we're in a new era in women's golf of, of great athleticism. The game is very different. The players, you know, when I was playing, people said, oh, Amy Alcott, she hits it like a man. And I used to be criticized that I was an aggressive player. But now everybody plays like that. And um, um, it's a compliment to be more athletic. And we're in this era um, of really quality golf that people can win more, and, uh, but it's tougher. The competition's much tougher. Um, so I think it should remain as, you know, difficult uh, for everyone. Going back to Lydia Ko, you said you had the chance to speak to her uh, last month. She is the youngest member of the LPGA Hall of Fame, will be when she is inducted. 27 years old, two majors, now three medalists, three medals, including a gold this year. Fantastic. You turned pro at 18. By 27, you had three major championships. So how are you able to appreciate what Ko is doing and all she has achieved, what is 
now officially a Hall of Fame career at such a young age? Well, I remember meeting Lydia at Mission Hills Country Club at the uh, at then the ANA or it was uh, the ANA tournament the, or Craft Nabisco before that, the one that I had won. Uh, the event obviously has had several sponsors um, with her uh, little glasses on and her mom on the putting green and um, the look in her eye of determination, but such a, a sweet person. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like she had the whole world ahead of her. And, you know, part of your, not your job, but your, your character is, you know, mentoring other great players that you th think along the way. I saw that in Annika. Um, and I still talk to her about uh, her early days when she had just joined the tour. But with, um, with Lydia, you know, she really won a lot of tournaments there. And then she had that lull. And um, I just think that she will um, relish this. Um, you know, players don't seem to, in this era right now, seem to be uh, playing as long. Um, they accomplish a goal and then they move on. Um, I remember Annika Sorenstam telling me one of the greatest things that I ever said to her was, don't forget to stop and smell the roses along the way. And that's exactly what I told Lydia. You know, one more tournament is not going to tell the world that you're any better a player than, than you are. You've made your mark in women's golf and you've given back and you can continue to do that and give back in a bigger way, even if you step back from the game. You didn't have the chance to play in the Olympics. You have played in, in plenty of international big events. It really seemed like on the men's side and the women's side in Paris this year, golf had its moment, that the athletes who were there truly appreciated the magnitude of the moment, whether it was Scotty Scheffler breaking down or Lydia Ko breaking down after receiving a gold medal. What do you think uh, the impact of golf in these Olympic Games is going to be? Well, I know that people labored over was should golf even be in the Olympics, um, and I th I've always thought that golfers are athletes. Uh, contrary to what a lot of sports writers used to write about, that uh, I rem remember reading in the Los Angeles Times every year, are golfers athletes? Well, they're overweight and they uh, they're not in shape and whatever. But this was the you know when I was a kid. Um, and now the golfers are the epitome of athletes and just even in, in heat to be able to walk 18 holes for five and a half hours. Um, you know, golfers are athletes and, um, um, it's always been kind of a controversial thing. Golfers are more, as I said earlier, more athletic and better form. Uh, you have to be the last four days playing competitive golf. It's just not going out and playing golf. So, um, you know, I think uh, America shines brightly. I'm glad to, uh, uh, changing the subject for a second, to see that we're, the USGA is coming, USGA is coming out with this developmental program to fur further uh, the quality of young players golf in the United States um, and kind of give back and so that we have a real future in golf um, uh, the United States is producing the best of the best.